we have an astronomer and dancer. Many of you will remember Apurva Jairaman from IDEA 2018. Today, she talks to us about the Padavarnams and the riddle of the languishing Naika. A little bit about Apurva. She, at the age of 16, with 11 years of learning and eight years of performing behind her, she decided to shift base to Chennai to seek the guidance of the greats, such as Guru Kalanidhi Narayanan. This move also allowed her to train under the famous Priyadarshini Govind, who she is still a student of, Apurva. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be back here for the second time at the IDEA Festival. Um, and particularly being part of today, which has been, I think, such a beautifully lucid and honest exchange of ideas among members of the dance community, and of course, splendid performances. So I thank Ganesh and Kavita and the rest of the team very much for having me back here once again. So the topic of my talk today is actually a result of a conversation that Ganesh and I happened to have last year, right after my performance at IDA. And I'm very happy that one year later, um, this gives me an opportunity to share with all of you some thoughts about this topic, which uh, has been very important to my own exploration in dance. So the Padavarnam, which has become a centerpiece of the traditional Bharatanatyam repertoire, hinges on the Naika, the heroine. Every Padavarnam almost insistently, recurrently, features a woman pining in love. She seems fragile, languishing in the ache of unsatiated love. And whether we look at the earliest compositions that are active in our repertoire today, like the 17th, 18th century Tanja quartet Varnams, going right up to late 20th century compositions like Innum Yenmanam Ariyadavar Pol Irindidal Nyayama, the rhetoric is clear. I seek you. Will you not pay heed to me? I suffer from the torment of separation. When will you come to me? Every single one of us in this auditorium, I am sure, at some point or the other, have vehemently disapproved of this pining naika. The 21st century person in us refuses to approve and even see any poetry in the idea of a woman withering away in love and almost willingly languishing in this feeling like she was almost savoring it. As students, we are usually given no more information to embrace this construct except for the conventional diktat that Shringaram, or love, is central to Bharatanatyam. The pining naika is said to be a metaphor for the jivatma seeking the paramatma, or so we are told. Now this meant very little to the 13-year-old me growing up in the world of dance 20 years, of, 20 years back, and I'm absolutely certain it means even less to the 13-year-old in the audience today. 
when it comes to understanding and performing the varnam a piece that we attach so much gravitas to a piece that is supposed to be a test of the dancer's command over his or her craft it made me uncomfortable that i and many of us continue to have problems reconciling with the naika who seemed to be at the very core of this piece most often the list of outstanding questions do not really end there why are there jatis between the abhinaya lines which almost seem to disrupt the emotional flow so are we supposed to uh, address this problem by juxtaposing motives and sthai bhava onto the nritta korves as well do boys have to play these naikas too or should they be doing some kind of hero based equivalence right and the questions really go on as a dancer of today it has been personally very important for me to engage with the naika and to rediscover her relevance for me viewing this idea through the lens of my own influences and the environment i grew up in if i don't see them as content that can not only resonate with but even influence today's audience is it justified that i continue to perform them the intent of my talk today is to present to you my own exploration of some of these questions and share with you what i have come to discover that this pining naika of the varnam is nothing but the voice of human aspiration human beings are purpose uh, are creatures of purpose the intense passion the torment of elusive distance from our goal that we feel sometimes the unyielding pursuit despite that these are all emo emotions that none of us can be unfamiliar with right this is irrespective whether that i'm trying to perfect that one particular jati or whether i'm trying to crack a math problem at school or whether i'm trying to make the cut to get into the university sports team we have all felt this emotion and we have an understanding of it intense passion torment of elusive distance unyielding pursuit these are the keywords that connect the pining naika to each one of us so i'm going to talk a little bit about looking at the naika not as a person a character that we play but in fact a unique grammatical element a genre in dance in bharatanatyam so genres such as shabdams kautuvams kirtanams which lend themselves to some abhinaya are primarily narrative in nature their primary intent is to communicate a story with focus on the object of interest which may be a deity and to evoke a sense of that object for example if i do a kirtanam like bho shambho the things i'm saying are things like gangadhara shankara karunakara imagery of shiva that would evoke in the audience's mind a sense of shiva but who am i who is the narrator who is saying this not important the narrator is invisible in sharp contrast the varnam as well as the padams and javalis which form the bulk of our abhinaya repertoire have a very well defined protagonist at their core the focus instead of being on some object of interest is now on the naika who is the protagonist and who becomes the primary voice in most pieces of the naika genre the identity of the person being spoken to even if it's a deity is usually inconsequential the object of interest of the naika could be muruga shiva venkateshwara anybody there's a great variety yet these pieces hardly ever go into puranic references about the deity in concern even the situation is not in any way contextually related to that particular deity so the name of this deity is probably merely a reference of comfort thus it's the naika who holds center stage in these genres and in transferring the focus from the one being spoken to 
to the one who is speaking, I think we've already done something extremely powerful here. Because what we've done is opened out the scope of discussion from things being a man-woman relationship to the intense passion of an individual, irrespective of the object of interest. And what comes into focus here is the capacity of the human being to harbor an unquenching desire, an almost unreasonable passion that urges you never to give up, a compelling quest for purpose. What is our complaint about the pining naika anyway? Why should a woman pine for a man? A man who has left her, a man who has little regard for her feelings, a man who is toying with her emotions. Not worth all this pain and torment, right? But a part of the problem here is already obliterated if you shift the spotlight from that object of interest to the naika herself. And if you accord her the respect of this agency, now, the question instead restates to, why shouldn't she pine? We find Mira poetic, right? And Mira was in pursuit of an idea called Krishna, not a man called Krishna. And here we are interested in Mira. She is fascinating to us. Her crazy madness in love is fascinating to us. Similarly so with Andal or Akamahadevi, so on and so forth. And there is really no question at all of who the man, man was, right? The, who they were in a love pursuit of at all. That's really inconsequential. The grammar of the Naika genre, therefore, becomes something very unique. The perspective is characterized by the dancer having to inhabit a nameless, yet very well-defined human voice. And to bring alive a voice in the absence of specific biographical references is something that really compels the dancer's craft and creativity into action. So by this I mean, instead of telling a dancer that you are to play Sita or Draupati or Krishna, I'm now telling a dancer you have to play a Khandita Naika, that is, a heroine who is angry with her lover because of a specific situation. So how angry is she? You have to decide. Is she going to be hurling abuses at this man? Or is she going to choose barbed sarcasm instead? You have to make informed choices. Is she going to hold her own? Is she going to burst down, you know, into, burst into tears? These are decisions that you make as a dancer. Each one of these choices that you make reflects your engagement with the craft and your creativity as an individual. The padam the varnam, the javali, therefore, becomes yours. It becomes a window through which the audience can see who you are. And even when you play a very well-edged naika, it cannot come with, without a bias of what your own worldviews are. So keeping this idea in mind, the shift of the spotlight onto the naika and to care about her in great detail, Instead of asking, what is she pining for? You can now ask the question, why doesn't she give up? What must be her state of mind of a person who can experience this intense passion? Why are human beings as a species indeed capable of such urgent passion for something? To start answering these questions, we have to look at the Varnams more closely looking for the information that is embedded in the construct of the lyrical and the dance composition, which most often we tend to miss for the woods, I feel. So, first of all, what causes the agony of this pining naika? There is no hint of a situation that leads up to the naika's emotion at all. The cause is never stated. The padams we often portray, we always have a prelude. For instance, the naika is waiting for the hero to arrive. She's excited at his arrival or she's seen him with another woman, right? So we build up preludes to padams. And whether we do a long prelude or not, we usually arrive right at the sthai baba, right at the start. How do we start our varnams? With a beautiful, neutral attami. And we don't get to the sthai baba well until the Trikalajati is done. 
there is absolute neutrality of emotion in the beginning. Is this by chance? I'll urge you to think of that as we go on to the next question. So what happens in the end? There is no conclusion. Does the Naika find what she is seeking? We're almost never told. And it's very salient to note that in Varnams, the tendency more often than not is to not end with the Pallavi line, but we end with the Charanam line, right? So if I'm doing a Padam, for instance, like Indendu Vachiti Vira, right? Indendu Vachiti Vira, Aladhanillu, Yividi Kadu, Popora. You're ending with a line which has a great degree of finality built into it. There are very few other ways that you can end this Padam, right? But the Charanam lines that Varnams end with is usually things like Sada Ninaivukundu, Mayal Meerade. Or Maran Kanaigal Tuvuran Saramariyaga. Right? So these statements, while they have a great degree of intensity, a sense of urgency, and there is a crescendo that is def definitely built up to the end, and this is left suspended at a high point. But we don't know what happens next, right? Does she attain? Does she find? We do not know. The format of the Varnams, if you notice carefully, is extremely non-linear. There is no chronology. There is no unraveling of scenes or acts. There is a tacit absence of a sense of here and now. The Pallavi Anupallavi Charanam structure, which is usually very clear cut in Padams, where the Pallavi states a situation, the Anupallavi qualifies or tells you why that situ situation has come about, and the Charanam gives you sort of elaborations almost with evidence at times, right? You see no such thing in a Varnam at all. So if you, for instance, take an example of a Varnam, right? Yenta ninne telupudura. How can I tell you what I'm feeling? How can I bear this torment? Now, these are all lines from the same Varnam. You put it in any order, I haven't even probably said it in the right order that it occurs. It does not mess with the idea that you're trying to convey at all. So there is no forward movement in the conversation, the conversation, if there is one, that is happening. So then the question comes to, who is she speaking to? In an almost um, heart-wrenching way, I think the Varnam is a soliloquy. As I mentioned earlier, the object of interest is really just a formality, quite replaceable. But in the Varnams, going a step further, I feel the object of interest is almost disembodied. When you say, Sami ninne kori nanura, I seek you, O Lord, you're really speaking to an unembodied object of interest. You're speaking to an idea. There is no space or respite in the lyrical setup of the piece to allow for interjections or for an exchange between these two persons. So if I can give you an example, for instance, if I were to do in a Varnam line, I would say, don't delay, right? As against when there is a padam, the reaction of the person to what you have said is extremely important, right? There is a response to what you are speaking. So, even though you're hearing a single voice in a padam as well, you're very much seeing and feeling a living, breathing person through the eyes of this protagonist, which is not the case with the Varnams. Therefore, when you ask, who is a Varnam about? I think a real answer should not be Tiruvarur Tyagesha or Brihadishwara, but the answer should be about the Naika. So, who is this Naika? With this almost formulaic layout, can the Varnam be a story of a distinctive woman? The Naika is given no attributes in a Varnam. You hardly ever know um, her nature, her manner. Is she sophisticated? Is she crass? Is she young, old? There is um, very less variation when it comes to the personality, personality traits of the Naika itself. And these are usually information otherwise 
that are stitched very carefully into the lyrical composition of Padams. And the information is there in everything, in the choice of words, in what is being said, in the ragam, in the pace, etc. But in a Varnam, I think there is a much greater degree of neutrality when it comes to embedded information like this. And therefore, I put to you, the Naika here is you, the dancer. The voice that is waiting to be discovered is yours. The metaphor allows each dancer to own instead of inhabit this voice. So it compels us to project our own personal quests onto this framework. And this is a much tougher ask. There is no character sketch to fall back on, no mannerisms, but just a strong emotion from a very deeply personal space. While the source is necessarily intensely personal, the account is not autobiographical. It does not call for you to engage specifics of your own life, such as your mannerisms or personality or the circumstances that you're in. Therefore, allowing the opportunity to project this emotional source onto an apersonal yet shared emotional landscape, right? So the spotlight now has gently shifted, but surely shifted from the Naika as well, purely onto what is being felt. The aspirations of each individual may be completely different. The goal need not be a deity or uh, the idea of God or a lover. To me, the goal could be dance itself, right? Uh, to a software engineer, it could be uh, creating code to uh, solve a particular solution. Yet, the passion, the torment, the unyielding pursuit are all common. So on the basis of this, I would like to loop back to uh, answer some of the questions of the, uh, about the Varnam I raised at the start. Um, yeah, just gonna... Okay. So we started with why Shringaram? Love ultimately is a universal emotion. So the lyricist could have taken the choice of using this as the metaphor, which took the dancer into that shared emotional landscape with the audience. If I talk about my pursuit in dance, the journey will be mine alone, right? Making the audience a mere spectator. If someone were to talk about their pursuit of, I don't know, gourmet cooking or something, it might exclude many sections of your audience who don't share your interests. Yet, by projecting your aspiration and quest onto a shared emotional landscape, it helps your audience to resonate with the funda fundamental emotion that you're trying to communicate without any kind of barriers. But is it always necessary that this metaphor should be based on love? Not necessarily. I think if rightly done, we can certainly have alternate metaphors that represent this voice of aspiration in an equally open manner that gives great space for the audience and dancer to meet. Whatever the metaphor, it is the complete suspension of time, space, and specifics in the representation that allows for that lingering resonance with your audience. And to successfully do this requires an acute and very intimate understanding of the dance form that we practice. And uh, one of the uh, examples that come to my mind uh, when talking about this was a varnam that I saw Srimati Rama Vaitinathan do, where she had picked up verses from the Guru Granth Sahib, which spoke about the yearning of, or the um, words of the fetus in the womb, which does not want to come out and come back into this uh, circle of life and death. And I thought that was a very, very interesting and visually powerful metaphor that fit into this uh, same format and worked wonderfully you know, while viewing this as an audience. Varnams which are based on this Thai Bhava of bhakti or devotion are usually looked at as substitute or playing second fiddle to the Shringaram Varnams. This is a very common thing that we hear. But I think the real distinction that we need to make here is not between bhakti or shringaram, but between the style being aspirational or narrative. If you're narrating a story, you cannot break into a jati in the middle. If you're having a conversation with a man which is intense, you cannot suddenly start doing a happy nritta sequence. But if you are in the pursuit of your goal in life, 
you two break out into life, right? So it absolutely makes sense. In fact, I have to break out into it. My pursuit in art certainly underlines my life and all my actions, but it's definitely not at the forefront of every single thing I do at every waking moment. We all clearly go about our you know, routines. Um, sometimes there is success, sometimes there is abysmal darkness inside, but there is always an elusive distance from our goal. It's almost like we can only get infinitesimally closer to it, but never attain that point, right? That point keeps eluding you. And the existence of the jatis and varnams, I believe, is to serve this purpose. It represents the intransience of this quest. It allows a breaking of chronology. It allows an oscillatory movement in the emotional landscape. And it allows the suspension of time and releases this quest from the shackles of here and now. So no matter when and where you pick it up, the hunger, the quest remains, only intensifying with time. So can boys play Naikas? I think this question now answers itself, and I'm very, very happy to have uh, heard the very beautiful comments that came up earlier during the panel discussion. Because I believe viewing the Naika in this manner, if the Naika is a voice embodied by you, if the Naika is a vehicle to evoke the common human quest, then she, if I may say so, in this case is already gender neutral. So unlike in Padams, it may not be necessary for people of any gender to compulsorily play the Varnam Naika in a feminine gender, right? There are, of course, a few exceptions, or perhaps several exceptions, to the list over here. Uh, and this was, again, something that came up in conversation with Ganesh last year. And there are several uh, compositions of Varnam which don't follow this uh, prescription. Um, like Dari Teliyaka, which is something that Ganesh pointed me towards, or E Mayal Adira, which seems to be a lot more in the format of a Padam, giving you a lot more information of the Naika. So I will not go into too much detail here, except to share with you, I don't have an answer when it comes to examples of that sort. Does that mean there isn't an answer? No. But it only means that I perhaps will not choose to perform those items till, till I'm able to gain my conviction in why those pieces can fit into this format and fit in successfully. So just to, um, in conclusion, I want to actually come to also again a very, very salient point, which has again come up during the discussions in the panel, and I'm very, um, uh, I was very excited to hear the views that were shared by the panelists and the audience, because this question of datedness is something that we have to engage with meaningfully. I think it's more so in a context like America, where perhaps from movies to school life, everything is very radically far removed from the ideas that we weave into our choreography traditionally, right? That doesn't mean that kids in India are growing up you know, with all of these as, as regularity, but more so. And not just this year, I think there were conversations held even last year at the panel discussion, which discussed this idea of relevance. And it made me think how important that idea is for us to discuss, not about is this relevant, is this not, but what is relevance, right? And especially before we transfer this art form down to the next generation. First of all, I would like to share, in my opinion, what relevance is not. Putting a column versus watching a TV. Um, eating butter versus eating popcorn. This is not relevance. This is convenience. Relevance is when you ask, will a woman experience love for a partner any differently today? Will she feel any restless when separated from him or her? Will she feel any less betrayed when she learns that her partner has been having an affair? And whether you're browsing Facebook or churning butter when this news arrives is absolutely immaterial. That is a matter of geography and ambience. I would say if we don't find relevance in a piece that we, we are attempting to do, we should not dance it. Leave it alone, because wrapping them in the garb of modern shores lends it no bearing whatsoever. 
The Naika remains relevant as long as we as a human race do not stop searching, do not stop yearning for purpose. The Naika remains relevant as long as we fall in love. The Naika remains relevant as long as we are driven by passion. The Naika remains relevant as long as we are unafraid of being independent, proud, and unique. Relevance needs to be found and acknowledged by each one of us, especially the artists, who are then capable of offering this Naika story convincingly as a member of today's generation to the audience or as teachers to our next generation. To find relevance in this material, we do not need to dress it up in the garb of spirituality, morality, or modernity. We simply need to discover the humanity in them. In conclusion, so I would like to say that I think, thinking of the Naika this way, it is extremely fascinating and certainly unique that the central piece of the current Bharatanatyam repertoire sounds a few exceptions, of course, represents this human quest, this search of the human mind. And think about it, there is no counterpart of the Padavarnam in most other classical styles, or I dare say any other classical style at this point of time. So I think it is exceptional that every Bharatanatyam kacheri that you walk into, and already three times today, you have walked into a place which reiterates and reminds you of this pursuit, this purpose that each one of us are after in our lives. And this way of understanding the Varnam convinces me of its pride of place in the Margam. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's no time for questions. Uh, but I'm sure Apurva will come meet you in the lobby as the day progresses. Thank you. If the performances today and the expert talks today and the lectem and dare I say the panel discussion does not want you, re want you to recommit to this art form, then we'll keep trying. <laughs>